So first I'd like to say that I am definitely glad to be here with you today. I am actually very, very excited <laughs> about being here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to pray for God to help me. Okay? So if you'll bow your heads with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you today here and in your house, Lord God, we ask that you would be with me as I have preached and also with everybody who is listening, Lord God, because the preaching moment is for both the preacher and the listeners, Lord God. So we ask that you prepare our hearts, Lord God, to receive your word, Lord God, and that you give us all exactly what we need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, the first thing I would like to do is I would like to, uh, or that I'm going to do actually, is I want to thank Pastor Carrie Kincana for going on vacation <laughs> and allowing me to be here and to preach in, on his behalf while he's away. Um, I really appreciate having this opportunity. And the second thing that I would like to do is to um, acknowledge the relationship that Bethlehem Baptist Church and Rising Hope has. Uh, my pastor, uh, Dr. Daryl K. White, has um, been working with you all in the congregation, and that seems like it's a beautiful relationship that you all have. The third thing that I would like to do is thank all the trustees and Dr. King Cannon because you all have granted our request, which is Temple Care Inc.'s request. And so we have an office space right across the hall that you all are leasing to us. And we greatly appreciate that because that really opened a big door for us. And so we want to tell you thank you for that as well. So today, uh, the topic that I want to preach from is, or uh, preach about rather, is true freedom. And that scripture, one second, there we go. Okay. I want to uh, speak to you today about true freedom. And as you know, tomorrow is Memorial Day, and we're going to celebrate Memorial Day. And Memorial Day is a time when we remember all of the people who died fighting for our freedom, our servicemen and women that guarantee our freedom. They are working sometimes while we're sleeping, sometimes while we're doing our business, going about our business, trying to keep America safe. And so we want to say thank you to them, definitely thanking them for uh, the freedom that they uh, made sacrifices for us to have. So can we just clap our hands for them? <laughs> Amen. So keeping that in mind, and keeping in mind that we need freedom, just like we need air that we breathe, the, the food that we eat, and the water that we drink, so our text is going to come from Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 23. Give you a moment if you want to find it, but I will read it for you. So the scripture reads, Then the high priest took action, he and all who were with him, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, being filled with jealousy, arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out, and said, Go, stand in the temple, and tell the people the whole message about this life. When they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and went on with their teaching. When the high priest and those with him arrived, they called together the council and the whole body of elders of Israel and sent to the prison 
to have them brought. But when the temple police went there, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked, the guards standing at the door. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. So this, this scripture, I happened to be listening to the, just listening to scripture, sometimes I do that. And this scripture just stuck out. It just, you know how things, you're reading them and they jump off the page at you. So it was kind of like that type of experience, although I was just listening um, to the word of God. And the interesting thing about this, this part of scripture is, it's telling us basically that these apostles, these Christians, just like us, but they, this, these were Christians in the early church. And so they were going about the business. They were going about their business. They were going about God's business. They were actually preaching and teaching the word of God. They were actually going through and telling people about God and seeing people healed and seeing other things happen as they shared the word of God. They were taking care of people who had needs and those type of, that type of thing. So these Christians became very popular. You know, they, the word was spreading, people were hearing, people were becoming Christians. And so the Sadducees and other Jewish elders, they got jealous. They said, well, you know, we can't have this, you know. So they actually, before they even locked the, the apostles up, they actually asked them, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Stop telling people about Jesus. Well, you and I know that you can't just stop telling people about Jesus, right? But that's what they told them to do. And so, because they did not stop, even though they had been in prison one time before, a couple of them, and then, but, this, but the, this next time, they imprisoned more than just Peter and John. They imprisoned more of the Christians at the same time. And so they were trying to, they had this debate, the, the Jewish elders, about what to do, and they couldn't decide what to do. So they just locked the Christians up in the jail so they could decide the matter. But, you know, they just, they just didn't count on God, you know. And this part about being jealous drove them to even publicly humiliate the disciples by locking them up in a public prison. And they securely locked them up. Not only did they put a lock on the door, but they also had the doors guarded. You know? Have you, you ever felt like that? <laughs> you, you know? I, I think we all can relate to this. If you're black American, you can relate to this because you have descendants who were slaves. And when the slaves were taken by force to come to this country and forced to labor and forced to work, until they were freed under the Emancipation Proclamation. But then they also suffered under prejudice, racism, segregation, etc. And some and so those things happen. And those are things can, that can make all of us feel bound, tied, restricted, and like we're in prison. But also if you're a Jewish American, you can understand it too. Because some of the Jewish Americans are descendants of people who were, who have relatives or descendants who were part of the Holocaust that were taken by the Nazis and forced to labor, sorting through their own stuff, okay? Just forced to, to labor, according to Victor Frankl. And then marched off to prison camps, I mean, marched off to gas chambers and died that way, just, just murder, just pure genocide. But you know what? The truth of the matter is all Americans can relate to this because right now we have a situation with terrorism. And the incident that just happened in Manchester, England, 
just it's just a reminder that there's this ongoing thing of where one group does not like another for whatever reason, whatever the motivation is, whether it be jealousy, whether it be greed, whether it be a misunderstanding of their faith. These things happen, unfortunately. And so, um, I want to, to kind of further explain, because sometimes when we think about terrorism, it seems so far and so distant. You know, it's like 9-11 happened a long time ago. And in this country, it doesn't seem like its effect on us is as great as it is in Europe. However, if the way it, it hits home for us is if you think about it like this, terrorism can cause people to be fearful and have doubts. And for the Washington, D.C. area, one of our sources of income is tourism. And so if tourists are afraid to come to the Washington, D.C. area, then that's going to affect the revenues that we receive in our hotels and our restaurants and all the things that they see and do while they, they're here. Okay, when that happens, that trickles down and it affects the workers. And employers will actually have less money to pay workers. And if workers have less money, and employers have less money, then guess what? The churches, like Rising Hope and other churches, can potentially receive less money. And so if we have less money, then we have less money to do the work of God. So whether it's over there, it's still over here, because it still has an effect on us. There are other things, though that process. If I think about my own story, I would say that oppression is anything, anything that keeps you separated from God. It's anything that threatens to bind you up and limit your full potential, limit what you can do, what you can be. So I would put drugs and alcohol and you name it, there are all kinds of things that you could put in the category of things that would limit your life, that would cause you to make you feel like you're bound and that you're in, you're in prison. So I just simply say it's anything that takes away your personal freedom. Now, when I was, um, at, one, at one time I would rush home uh, on Wednesdays to see a show called Ninjago with my nephew. And the one thing about the show was, it would say, they, they would repeat this thing that they would say, uh, a person was able to do something, and that was on their way to achieving their full potential, okay? So I think the writers of Ninjago would say, the true freedom is having the ability to reach your true potential. It's, it's what I think they would say, you know. Um, but then, you know, I look at others like Paul. Paul would probably say, it's that place where you, where you rest, where you abide in God, you know, and that you can have little or you can have much, but it doesn't matter because you're in God. I think that's what Paul would say. It is. But I would say that true freedom is a place where you understand and you're aware that you will have struggles in life. You will feel broken. But it's a place where you're kind of like the onion. And the onion, I found out on Friday, is an interesting thing because the onion, on the outside, it can get all bruised up. It can look all bad. It can feel kind of slimy, like you don't want to touch it. But as you take away that outer layer, on the outside, the onion looks all nice and round and good and, and perfect, you know? But then as you, as you keep going, that onion has like several rings. But on the 
inside is like there's a core. And I don't know how God made the onion. I don't know how, how God makes the onion even grow with all those different grains. But I want us to think of the place of true freedom like the core of the onion. You know, we may not know how God does all the things that he's doing for us. But the, the main important thing about the freedom is being able to have that, that sight that we were talking about and God opening our eyes for us to be able to look and see, hey, God moved in my past. He moved when I wasn't sure how I was going to pay that bill. And it seemed like a miracle happened. And I was able to pay that bill. Or it's a place where you say, you know, Lord, I, I just don't know what to do. I need some guidance. I need your direction. I need you to show me. And somehow you read a passage of scripture, or you come to church and you hear a word from the Lord, you get something that helps you. That is the Lord. That's that true place of freedom. Now, um, Paul also said something about where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then I would say to you that if we want true freedom, and that's what a lot of us are searching for, that place where, where we can grow, that place where we can move, that's in Jesus Christ. So we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I would say that true freedom, we have to access it. So God always gives us a choice, right? Freedom of choice was the first thing he gave us, you know. And so we have to choose to access that true freedom. We have to choose to, re to access Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you that how we do that, is we have to think of it like this, that Jesus Christ is standing, waiting behind the door with his arms wide open, just waiting us for us to open that door and to ask him to come into our hearts and, and be our personal savior. And so we can choose as Christians to open that door to true freedom, or we can choose to let it stay shut. That's our choice. He's not going to force us to do that. So to become a Christian, though, all we have to do is accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, repent of our sins, and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we do this, as we talk in Christian terms, then we become the temple of God. And when we become the temple of God, then God, I want to say, is amplified. We're able to hear him more. We're able to see his movement in the world more. As that place where we become Christians, we become the temple of God. We're in this place of true freedom. And this is the place where, in my own life, it seems that God opens doors. I don't know how doors get open necessarily. I don't know how the connections were made just perfect. And I'm like, wow, isn't that good? Isn't that amazing how that happened? It's happened. But, but God does that. Even when we're in the state of brokenness, he's advocating on our behalf to bring us back to wholeness, to bring us toward wholeness. So this is this life. That, that we're talking about, the life where we can be free in Jesus Christ. And true freedom enables us to do something else. It enables us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. It also enables us to overcome obstacles in life that we face. And sometimes it might be that it, you might not be the gazelle that jumps over the obstacle, but God may teach you the grace 
to be able to deal with whatever the obstacle is. So it's God's choosing how he chooses to help us, but the fact is, he does help us. He does provide that freedom to us. In this scripture, it points out to us in Acts 5, 19 through 20, um, that the angels of the Lord gave the Christians the keys to true freedom. And I, I, I believe that that happened because he told the angels something. Not only did not only did the angels come and they unlocked the doors, okay, but the angels gave a word as well. The angels said, "Go, stand in the temple, and tell the people the whole message about this life." Okay. Well, the first part is about the go part. Okay, so I want to say the first point was go to church. Okay, now understand this. Before, people would go to the temple seeking God, right? Because the Jews thought that that's the place where God resides. But then Jesus came, and we have Jesus in our hearts, right? But what coming to church is about it's about building our horizontal relationship with God, strengthening that. And then it's also about that, I'm sorry, our vertical relationship with God, that's the correct way to say it, and our horizontal relationship with everyone else. Okay? Because in that vertical relationship that we're building with God and we're growing with God, then we also learn how to grow with others. As we learn and we grow together, we fellowship together, it's all part of our growth. So those are good reasons to come to church. We also learn about God when we come to church. And when we come to church, it's also a place where God can give us help. Because sometimes we're struggling with something, and I may talk to one of you, and one of you may tell me something that helps me. I mean, I've walked up to Horizon Hope, and I'm just walking along, and I say, hey, how are you doing today? And somebody says, well, God woke me up this morning. And I'm walking inside, going, wow. You know, that really preached to me, because, you know, I'm rushing and hustling and trying to do all these things. And I didn't even stop to think about God waking me up this morning and how precious that is, you know? And then I'm out there doing something else, and. I'm just talking with someone who comes to Rise and Hope, and they say to me, well, you know, the reason why I do this is because God has been good to me. And they said it with such conviction. I said, well, yeah, God has been good to me too, you know. So you never, never know, but coming to church is, is a way to, to grow and a way to expand in that true freedom. And so going back to the onion, I kind of think about the onion because it's got that core, that core is that freedom, that true place in God, right? The true place in Jesus Christ. But it has these outer layers, you know? And so I think about it like, oh, so when I come to church, I grow and I go to the next level, and then I grow and I go to the next level. And the onion is interesting because it's, it's all onion, but, but, it, but it grows. And so I, th I think that's interesting. Um, now, the other interesting part of this, he said, go and stand in the temple. Go and stand in the temple. Okay. So I thought about that too because in the earlier church, they used to worship. They would stand up, like we were standing up, and they would praise God. And so I thought, oh yeah, you go to the temple, you learn, you get help, you grow, and you praise God in the temple. In the temple, you tell people about Jesus. That's what they told them to do. Go stand there and tell people about Jesus. Now, one of the interesting things is um, when we talk about telling people about Jesus, oftentimes I think we are wondering, well, hmm, 
what do we tell them about Jesus? You know, what do we tell them? Do we just tell them that Jesus woke me up this morning? Hmm. I think we tell them, we go and we tell them about this Jesus who is God that came down in human form, born of a Virgin Mary, wrapped himself in human flesh, died on the cross for your sins and mine, so that we might have life. We tell them about that. We tell them not only about how Jesus turned water into wine, but we tell them about how Jesus has the power to transform lives like the woman at the well, or raise the sick from the dead. We tell them about the power of the Holy Spirit to help guide our lives, to help us, give us comfort, to show us the way. You know that thing we were listening to that said, uh, where you go, I'll go, I'll follow you. That's what that's about. Then we tell them about in this true place of freedom with Jesus Christ, for we can get the love of God. And that love of God that God has for us is so strong that we can share that love with everybody else. And that's how we can begin to love our neighbor. Even though we may have differences, even though we may not believe the same thing, but because we're in this true, true place of freedom, we can let others know about it and have the same freedom that we enjoy. Now, I wish I could say that this idea about true freedom was all mine. But I really can't. Because be before I got this thing about the true freedom and the God that's there for us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, I was kind of, um, sometimes we're in a place where something has happened to us. And we're like that onion. We're bruised on the outside. We're hurt on the outside. But God reaches in and frees us just like he did those disciples long ago. And so I was just like that bruised, hurt, scarred. But Jesus rest in and unbound me, you know, took away that outer layer, you know, so the other things could shine through. And that's how I began through studying the Word of God. And I kept studying and I was, I was studying, I was, I was actually looking for something. So I was studying all these different things. Sometimes life is like that. You think you're on your way to one place. But God is really working with you, um, showing you something else. And so I was going to tell you that I don't. Okay, I want to. I, I want to be truthful and honest with you. Um, I was actually working on a book about Prince, and Prince is a Jehovah's Witness. I don't believe all the things that Jehovah's Witness believe. But Prince had this concept of, of true freedom. So I was researching, trying to understand what he meant by that. And as I researched and I studied my Bible and I researched and I looked, I began to understand that that's that place in Christ where no matter what happens, no, ma no matter who's talking about you, no matter who's telling lies on you, no matter how you get hurt, no matter what your body can't do anymore, that's that place where you're in God and you can be as creative as you want to, you can share the word of God as much as you want to. But then, you know, Victor Frankel, Victor Frankel is Jewish. I don't necessarily believe everything the Jews believe. Because, well, for one thing, I'm not Jewish, I'm a Christian, you know, and I, I strongly believe that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross to save us from our sins, and that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. But I learned something from Victor Frankl, who, I read a book who, 
was talking about searching for meaning in life. And he was talking about, again, this place of freedom, where he became freer than his captors. Then I thought about the slaves long ago who sang songs and spirituals. Sometimes they ran away. No, they weren't always uh, able to get to freedom. But they were able to find a God who they knew and believed that one day that God would set them free. And we're all benefits of their faith in God and believing in God that there is a place of true freedom. And I believe that even though they suffered persecution, some of them understood that that was in God. You can't help but think that when you listen to all the spirituals. Then there was Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And he talked about that all men are created equal and that there are certain unalienable rights. Um, among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thinking about the founders of this country, how they came to escape religious persecution. Can't help but think they understood that there's a place of freedom in Jesus Christ. But before Prince, Victor Frankel, Thomas Jefferson, there was Jesus. And Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that's what we're talking about. We are talking about freedom in Jesus Christ, because that's where the Spirit of the Lord is. So as we go forth celebrating Memorial Day, what I would like for you to remember is I like you to remember Christ. Because Christ is the one who died on the cross to set us free from all of our sins. To set us free from anything that binds us. So with that, I pray that you will continue to pursue that place of freedom in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.